Northern China contains a rich and colorful world. Fire and ice have forged a unique landscape, and many creatures make this land their home. In this region, the mountains, plains, lakes and grasslands force inhabitants to suffer the extremes of arid or humid weather, fertile or barren soil, and harsh or mild temperatures. Still, here in the Hershig Ten Banner, life takes hold regardless. By June, Hershig Ten has entered summer. Compared to other regions on the same latitude, summers here are short. The plants and animals mature quickly. In this often harsh environment with such a vast variety of species, each species has to develop its own survival strategy. They need to make the best of the short growing season and its many challenges. Hershig Ten is located between the Inner Mongolian grassland and the Greater Kingan Mountains. And in its south, it has a special geographical area. A desert. But this desert is not a place devoid of life. It's a temperate place with a flourishing biological world. Entering summer, the sands land begins its self-healing stage. The leading actors are the flourishing plants and animals. As we know, plants need sunshine, but these elms thrive where sun may not always shine. This is because the spring sunshine quickly melts the snow on the sunny slopes and it evaporates rapidly. On the shady slope, snow melts more slowly, providing plants with a precious water supply. From an ecological perspective, the capacity of this place is greater than the grasslands, as both shrubs and tall trees can grow here. The sand here has a favorable water seepage and storage structure. Nourished by water, shrubs and herbaceous plants appear. Using them as shelter, the seedlings of the elms can grow and join the shrubs in this fierce competition for survival. Once they settle down, elms will weed out other competing species and the dominant elms will spread. Eventually, a savanna landscape is formed, a rare sight in temperate zones. There are, in fact, only two places like this on Earth. The tropical savanna in Africa and this desert. The desert here provides living space for animals.
The ruddy shell ducks there found a hole in an old dead elm. It's a good place to observe the nest of the ruddy shell ducks. The female duck seems hesitant. Perhaps she's seen the hidden camera. She doesn't enter until she's sure there's no danger. Ruddy shell ducks like to nest in all kinds of natural caves and holes. This secluded spot is a very good choice, but it could also cause a huge problem. There's a gap of over two meters between the bottom of the hole and the entrance. How will the little ducklings leave? The female duck doesn't seem at all worried, so it seems she must have a plan of her own. Eridang Batar has moved his family home from a winter camp at the foot of the greater King Anne Mountains to the grasslands. This morning's work is more like entertainment. Usually, herdsmen choose their summer pasture next to a river or a pond. The cows and sheep can then enjoy the inexhaustible grass and the ample supply of water. However, the Hershington environment wasn't always like this. About 5,000 years ago, this location was where the early northern Chinese farming culture developed. But then, the climate changed, becoming cold and dry. It was then that the people switched to a nomadic lifestyle, living on the grassland. On the rocks of Anvil Hill near Dalinur Lake, there are rock paintings of running horses. These paintings record part of the history of herdsmen living and prospering here. The domestication of horses marked the real birth of nomadic herders. It was only when the herdsmen had mastered the knowledge and skills of horse running that they were able to follow and eventually control herds of cows and sheep and to move in a larger dimension. These nomadic people would rise up again and again on this immense grassland as a powerful force. The elm seems like the master here, but in Hershigten it's forced to face a very powerful competitor, the spruce tree. From the moment a seedling bursts from the earth, it begins a long juvenile growth period. In this period, it grows just two to three centimeters a year. Reaching a height of one meter takes 30 years. It's only after 30 years that the spruce trees finally grow quickly and healthily. During this period, they grow 30 to 40 centimeters each year. To successfully take root in the sand, the tree stretches its enormous roots downwards. The tap roots of this tree have degenerated, but its lateral root system is extremely developed. The lateral roots exposed on the ground are thick and dense. They can stretch as far as 10 meters, 
but are further than its own crown. According to calculations, the roots make up more than 70% of the weight of the entire tree. It is this highly developed root system that helps these spruce trees reach to the sky. The average height when a tree is 50 years old is over 10 meters. The height finally surpasses that of the elms. Under the thick crown of the spruce trees, the elms lose the sunshine. To survive, they must exploit new territory on other sand dunes. These spruce trees near water have a more abundant water supply. This tree is over 20 meters tall, and that means it's probably more than 200 years old. As these trees are very dependent on water, they grow near rivers or underground water. Seen from above, they resemble a deep green river. The competition between the spruce and the elms has changed the appearance of the desert. It also stops the sand dunes from moving, and the landscape thus avoids becoming just barren desert. As this place doesn't have a very advantageous ecological environment, here the trees are both the beneficiary and the creator of the environment. In this lazy summer, it seems young people don't have much to do. And her, the second son in Bartara's family, decides to make good use of his time. Today, and her plans to lasso a few of their horses as backups. <laughs> When he was young, Batar was a master of lassoing horses. But these days, he's entrusted his son with taking care of the horses, as it requires a lot of physical stamina. Woo, woo, woo. On the grassland, horses that haven't been broken are particularly wild. When lassoing a horse, you must separate the target horse from the others. This requires a lot of patience. Then her takes his time and follows the herd. After a few laps, a smaller red horse gradually separates from the herd, giving Unher his chance. He throws a lasso using the lasso rod and catches the horse. Usually, the eggs of the ruddy shell duck take four weeks to hatch. When the time comes, nearly all the ducklings emerge overnight.
the ruddy shell ducks it's a matter of the more the better. But at the moment there are still two eggs that haven't hatched. Their mother must continue to wait for them patiently. Newly hatched ducklings can only rely on eggshells for their nutrition. As there's no food or water in the tree hole, they'll certainly die if they stay here. But it's also impossible to fly out, since they won't be able to fly for another two months. So how will the parents get these little ducklings out of here? As midsummer approaches, more and more migrant birds raise their offspring. Urshikten is on the west of the greater King Anne Mountains. But vapor from the Pacific Ocean is blocked by these mountains. This means that sometimes clouds pass in the sky, but there's no precipitation. The relentless sun evaporates the moisture of the grassland and a crisis quietly approaches. The once flowing streams will soon dry up. Parts of the grassland pasture have already withered. It appears as if autumn has come early. A pile of stones like this is called an owl bow. People living on the grasslands have a custom of worshipping them. Most owl bow are built on hillocks or hills. The most sacred owl bow on the Hershig Ten grassland is the Bayin owl bow. May the 13th on the lunar calendar is the day for worshipping them. Interestingly, owl bows are male or female. Even children have their own owl bows. The most sacred Bayin owl bow is a father owl bow. Only men can climb to the top of the hill to worship it. The worship ceremony began the night before. It has to end before dawn. They come here to pray for good weather and for their cattle and sheep to flourish. No matter how developed this place becomes, as long as people depend on nature, they will never lose their respect for it. As the drought continues, a pair of grebes closely guards their nest. A unique kind of local midge is now plentiful. In the freshwater wetlands near Dalinur Lake, a dense mass of midge darken the colour of the lake shore. Although the adults can only live for a very short few days, in the warm season the females can lay eggs without being fertilised. Each time, dozens, even hundreds of eggs can be deposited. The offspring are mostly female. Eventually, each year's increasing population will lead to a final explosion. These midges then provide high protein nourishment for birds that are reproducing. The eggs are also natural food for fish. And there's another benefit. The larvae eat the organic matter at the bottom of the shallows, making the water cleaner.
The arrival of the midge is a good thing, but the arrival of another insect could be a disaster. In the deep green spruce forest, some areas have turned red. It's as if they were burned by fire. It appears as if a disaster has just passed through, but this disaster isn't over yet. The problem is caused by wood-boring beetles that thrive in the branches of the spruce. In the dry climate, they bore in all directions inside the tree. Even a tree dozens of meters tall can be taken down by this tiny insect that measures just a few millimeters. The outbreak would be kept under control if there were a downpour of rain. Forest rangers, however, can't pray for rain. They have found another effective method. This box emits a tempting scent that the beetles simply can't resist. It's from synthetic estrogen. The males all enter, striving to be the first. It's important to conserve the spruce trees because of their ability to retain water and stabilize the sand. This place is just 500 kilometers from Beijing, the capital of China. Small changes here could lead to environmental deterioration in a much larger place. Every effort must be taken to prevent this sand land from becoming a full desert. The ongoing drought benefits the ruddy shell ducks. The ducklings are hiding in the vertical tree hole with no cover. But if it rains, these ducklings will all die. And there are two eggs that haven't even hatched yet. If they keep waiting for the two unhatched chicks, the ducklings that hatched first will probably die of hunger and thirst. The female has to make a decision. The female duck calls from outside the tree and the ducklings begin to jump up using their soft young feet to help them. Ruddy shell ducks are very good swimmers. Their fledglings are born with the ability to swim. But now it's time to test their climbing skills. When they fail, they have to start over. Outside, the parents wait anxiously. Every bit of delay causes extra danger. A step eagle appears in the sky. The appearance of this predator makes the mother more anxious. More and more ducklings exit the tree hole. They get closer to their mother. But the nest they hatched in may still yet be the place of their death. This is a cruel reality of nature. Even before they've had a bite of food, they must begin or end their lives like this. The remaining ducklings are still teetering on the edge of life and death. This one almost made it, but fell to the bottom again. The effort takes its toll. The female duck has to bring her offspring to the water before dark. The remaining duckling in the nest has used up all its energy and can't jump anymore.
Her mother has done everything she can. Now she has to be responsible for the rest of her babies. They can only start a new life after they pass through this forest and find water. Sometimes such a sacrifice is the only option to preserve the rest of her brood. In the summer, the tall Greater King Anne Mountains can stop the water vapour from passing by. This is, in fact, the demarcation line of the monsoon region in China. The humid air from the Pacific Ocean can reach this area every year with the push of the monsoon. Around Huanggang summers in the greater King Anne Mountains, the forest displays a special Northeast Asian scene. Here, stretches of birch forest grow from the base to the very top of the mountain. These trees find places to root in the rocks. Another mountain in Hershig 10 does an even better job of demonstrating that plants can conquer rocks. The top of Qingshan Mountain, over 100 kilometers south of the Stone Forest, is where you can find the most granite mortars. Here, they're distributed more densely than any other place in northern China. Without enough horizontal and vertical joint growth, after millennia of erosion, the granite on Qingshan became rounded. All over these large rocks, there are pits and holes of various sizes. Over time, some of the holes connect to become one larger hole. These natural wonders were created by water and wind. And later, they will bring life here too. The first form of life to appear in a hole is grass takes hold in small pits with just a little soil. The grass then prevents the soil from being blown away by the wind. With the spread of grass, the soil becomes increasingly thick. With water and soil, the plants expand their living territory at their own pace, and eventually trees start to grow here. The Greater King Anne Mountains host a birch forest and seeds of the birch tree travel with the wind. Most of the seeds land on smooth rocks or granite mortars with no soil and these will not germinate. However, some of the seeds land in the right spots and they will grow. The force of water and wind continues to erode the rocks. But the water and wind also help grass and trees to grow. 
In the process, roots grow down into cracks and this speeds up the shape-shifting of the granite mortars. The different sizes of mortars on the mountaintop are actually at different stages. If we view a granite mortar as a special life form, then these small and shallow mortars are the young ones. The big and deep ones are the seniors. In the final stage of this very long process, just a few dilapidated pits and holes are left. The force of the wind will clean away all traces and then start new creations. After a long wait, the rain finally comes. Low-lying places in Hershig 10 fill with water. On the west shore of Dalinur Lake, grass has spread all over the volcanic tableland. Haolai River flows in the low-lying places with a relatively thicker soil layer, chiseling narrow, hidden river channels into the grass. It's probably safe to call this the narrowest river in the world. The welcome rain helps to ease the hunger and thirst of the livestock, and the herders are now much busier than before. On this day, all the children of the Batar family have returned. They're going to take part in a very important family activity. In midsummer, all of the sheep will be sheared. Their owners will help them shed their coats in the shortest time possible. selects the sheep from the flock. But grabbing hold of one is not an easy task. Once they're shorn, the sheep can have some relief from the summer heat. But of course the sheep don't understand these good intentions. Production activities on the grassland are of course seasonal. Activities like sheep shearing require the whole family to help out. Shearing sheep requires skill. You begin at the sheep's tail. It needs to be clean and tidy, but you mustn't damage the skin. It's the kind of job that requires patience and skill, and it's suitable for women. Only a complete fleece will gain a good price. Before selling the livestock in autumn, wool is the main source of income. With their thick fleece gone, the sheep return to the grassland to graze. The plants on the grassland are now getting a water supplement. The ponds scattered here and there are now filled with water. After their test of life and death, the mother ruddy shell duck and her baby settled down in a small pond at the foot of Aubau Hill. In less than a month, the ducklings have grown quite tall. They can now forage and eat water plants by themselves. The male stands guard. Whenever he sees any sign of disturbance or danger, he alerts his family. 
A tern arrives, but this doesn't worry the ruddy shell ducks. Its nest is on the islet in the pond. Every time the female duck approaches, the tern flies back at full speed. Its message couldn't be clearer. The water is yours, but the islet is mine. The ruddy shell ducks are happy with this arrangement. And the herdsman and his cattle also have no intention of disrupting this peaceful life. It seems that all who live in the small world of the pond have a contract that they abide by. The male duck's guard duty is not merely for show. When step eagles suddenly appear in the sky, he calls out a warning. When hearing the call of their father, the ducklings take evasive measures. The step eagle comes closer and closer. You can almost clearly see his feathers. The ducklings all dive and hide in the water. It's another survival skill they've acquired after their escape from the tree hole. Seeing no opportunity to strike, the step eagles continue on to their original destination, Albao Hill. Worship ceremonies on Albao Hill never cease through the four seasons. People who come to worship here leave tributes for the gods. After the people leave, however, the place becomes the domain of the crows and step eagles. Step eagles are seen frequently in the sky above Albao Hill and gradually the tributes to the gods return to the sky. The ruddy shell duck family can finally relax. The nesting pair had 12 eggs in the tree hole. The two unhatched eggs and the duckling that couldn't climb out stayed in the tree forever. On the way to water, another two ducklings became lost. So, in the end, only six survived. And for these survivors, the challenges have only just begun. There are many flowers on the grassland, and there are many festivals too. Today is the 70th birthday of Mongolian teacher Jamu Su. After dozens of years of teaching, the students now span several generations. And his students are all here. People can take this opportunity to have a happy reunion. On the grassland, the grandest festival is still Nadam festival. Just as in nature, where animals sometimes scatter and then sometimes gather, the people of the grassland use this time to come together.
The history of Nardam dates back to the tribal union assembled in the time of Genghis Khan. On the immense grassland where every family is a unit, nomadic people move freely with their cattle and sheep. While this all may appear undisciplined, when necessary the nomads will assemble quickly to form an invincible team in no time at all. Long ago, Genghis Khan took advantage of the mobility of his people to form a system of social organization that combined production activities with military functions. In the age of cold weapons, he launched one invasion after another and conquered a vast territory. On the west shores of Dalinur Lake, you can still see mounds of earth connected in a line. This is the Great Wall of the Jin Dynasty built in the 12th century to resist the Mongolians. As there was no stone on the grassland, they could only build walls of earth. And to Genghis Khan, it was little more than a decoration. The army of Genghis Khan swept across the entire Eurasian steppe, and he built up an empire that stretched all the way to Europe, adding his name to history. Once the nomadic people built cities and began to lead settled lives, they lost their capacity for mobile combat, and as a result, the dynasty faced destruction. This fate is common amongst nearly all steppe empires. In 1368, the last Mongolian Yuan dynasty emperor to rule the central plains of China, Emperor Shun, retreated to the northern grassland with his ministers and imperial bodyguards. He chose the ancient city of Yingchang, located at the west shore of Dalinur Lake. In this place, these rulers who had lost an empire indulged in vice. And just two years later, Emperor Xuan died in depression. Time flies and the winds and clouds of history scatter. But the tradition of Nadam was kept and passed on. And eventually, it became a carnival for herdsmen. Compared with the excitement of history and legends, the daily life of normal people is very friendly and real. During the Dharm Festival, one can watch skillful tailors showing off their skills. <laughs> Veteran craftsmen display their rare saddle workmanship. <laughs> Perhaps the most popular craft to observe is the Mongolian ladies rolling and making felt. Layers of wool are pressed tightly together. Felt made in this way is very warm and thick. It's the primary material used by Mongolians to build yurts, which resist wind, rain and snow so well. Batara's fourth son and her Girigala has also come. He's a great wrestler. Mongolian wrestling doesn't classify by age, weight or rank, and the winner is decided as soon as one falls. Only the person that keeps winning to the end can win the championship. The Nadam Festival's most exciting event, however, is the horse racing. This exciting scene takes the people who live here back to the time when they roamed and conquered. Through it, they experience the honor of their ancestors. Everything outside the venue for the Nadam Festival remains serene. 
but stories of life are everywhere. On the volcanic tablelands near Dalinur Lake, where only a thin layer of grass grows, an elm seed used water accumulated in the pits to sprout, and it kept growing for hundreds of years. Eventually, it became an old sacred tree. Herders came to the tree and tied red ribbons on its branches, hoping that the sacred tree would bring them good luck. Inside its dry trunk, there's a bird's nest. Inside this ancient tree, new lives are about to be born. In every space that can protect and sustain new life, the tough and resilient inhabitants of this land renew the bond with the land. In Hershig 10, countless stories of life are told again and again. In autumn, Hershig 10 opens her arms to welcome the birds gathering here in a most generous way. This is the pride of the Hershig 10 people. Their kindness, affection, perseverance and love allow the life story of this place to continue. <laughs> 